Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. That was a blessing. <laughs> Memories of my days in fourth grade, I think, when I came home with a trombone. And um, now I know what it was supposed to sound like. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer as we get into God's word. Father in heaven, Lord, this morning as we bow before you, we want to thank you for the opportunity to come and partake of the manna that you have given us from heaven. Lord, you have called it angel's food in the Bible. It is that which sustains them and gives them spiritual life, strength and wisdom and all the above. Father, we ask to partake of that today. We pray that your Holy Spirit would just stimulate our hearts and our minds today, that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law and thy truth. Father, send your Holy Spirit upon your servant that I might speak for you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Are we recording? All right. It doesn't show on there anymore. Usually there's a little red light that came on, and I knew it was recording, but we got a different system now. I'd like to start off <clears throat> with a reading. What General Wagen has called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned upon us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be freed and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. It's a speech given by Winston Churchill in June 18th of 1940. There are some people that believe that that was the defining moment of British civilization, of the British people. The concept that we're going to look at this morning is along those lines. Is it possible to summarize something to come up with its essential truth? In other words, to take a race, a tribe, a family, a person, and say, this event defines them. I want you to look at your own lives today and think about that. Some of us have lived a short period of time. Some of us have lived a medium point of time. And some of us have lived a long period of time. As you look back on your, the story of your life, could you say that there would be one event that would define who you are? that it was your hour. You might say, well, that's not fair, Pastor. There's a lot of things that happened in my life. How can I distill it into one event? And maybe that event really was a mistake. You know, there's a good case for uh, Hitler, for instance, being defined by the Holocaust, right? I mean, when you think of Adolf Hitler, many people, especially of, Julia, especially of Jewish uh, descent, 
think of the Holocaust, that that was the event that defined the life of Hitler. What about you and I? You know, I look back at my life, and I, I've had a number of different things that happened to me. And I've asked myself, is there an event, is there a, something that's happened that defines me? Now, I've done some bad things in my time. And perhaps the perspective has a, has a, a, um, a weight on that. Because there's some people that might say, well, your defining moment was that one. You know, when you did thus and such. I'll never forget that. There are people in our lives that would point to that time when you made the most horrible mistake you ever made in your life. And then for the rest of your life, that's what you're known for. That could be it. Or it could be uh, some of those instances that we've heard about recently where you happen to be at the right place at the right time when there was a, a um, live shooter, where there was a mass shooting, and you were the one that happened to be able to tackle that guy or to at least interfere with him being able to kill any more people. And the media hailed you as a hero. And your life never was the same from that moment on. You got interviewed by everybody. They wrote a book about you. They even made a movie about you. And then it was all said and done, you went back to life as normal. And some people would say that was the defining moment of your life. That's who you are. Is that fair? Sometimes it doesn't seem that way. You know, the scientists tell us that if we were to render the human body down to its most elemental units, we would be, uh, I don't know how many pounds it is, of just uh, organic material. That's what we would be. That would be the definition, just a pile of dirt on the floor. That would be the definition of a human being. Is that fair? Well, it seems like we're a lot more than that, right? But I want you to stay with me for a minute because I think that it is possible. It, it probably is not possible for human beings to do it, but I think that it is possible to define a human being by one particular moment in their lives. Now today, as you look at the British Empire, or I should say the British um, nation, you may not see the gleams of glory from their finest hour in World War II. They're a long way from that. And there are many people that say that they have fallen from glory and have not lived up to their finest hour. History is full of people and nations and kingdoms that had their finest hour for a while but then fell from it. I'd like you to turn to Genesis chapter 3 and we're going to look at verse 6. Because we're going to take a look for a moment at this concept of divining defining somebody by what happened in their lives in some of the Bible characters. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. We don't need to go into the story very deeply. We, we know it by this particular verse. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise... She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and what? And he ate. So you could make a case for the fact that this was the defining moment in Adam's life. Now we know that the dominion of the entire planet wasn't forfeited to Adam until, or, or to uh, Lucifer until Adam took of the fruit. So when he did, it changed the course of history, right? 
And I think you can make a pretty good case for the fact that this defined Adam's life. Now, it is true that we know from Spirit of Prophecy that Adam went on to live a godly life. And with all his heart and soul, he sought to warn his children away from the mistake that he had made, which I think a lot of parents understand. Not even one amen? I hope, parents, that you are warning your children away from the mistakes that you made. I hope that you're not setting yourself up as perfect because that's a tall ladder to fall from. But I hope that you do help your children understand your mistakes. You don't have to go into details, but recognize, you know, that, hey, I wouldn't go there. I've been there, done that, and it doesn't work. And I believe that that's what Adam did. But nevertheless, when you look at Adam... It just seems like that's what he's going to be known for for the rest of his life. I mean, Adolf Hitler is another case in point. You know, there may have been a time that Adolf was a really nice person in his early years. Eventually, he ended up making himself into a devil by making bad choices. But forever, the human race will know him Uh, defined by the Holocaust, and Adam likewise by the fall in the Garden of Eden. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 11 and take a look at a couple more of those. Hebrews chapter 11. By the way, I I was looking around and I noticed that we've got a number of of guests here, people that are relatively new. Some of you aren't new. Uh, Some of you, well, Let me just say that you've uh, been here and on and off for a while. And I I want to encourage our members to reach out to folks that may be a little bit new here. Okay? Make sure that they're feeling a welcome. Remember what you learned in kindergarten. What did you learn in kindergarten? Be nice. Play nice. Make everybody feel welcome. All right, share your toys. That's right. That's a good one. All right, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and let's look at verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. What do we know about Abel? Not really a lot, do we? We know he was the second son. The main thing that we know about him, the main thing that defines him to us is what? The fact that he offered the right sacrifice, right? Now, you could say we know him because he was the first murdered person. I mean, you could say that. But Hebrews notices him, defines him as the one who offered a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain. So he's defined by that sacrifice, I mean, this guy, we don't know how long Abel lived, and he probably had some significant things happen to him, but all we know, all that God chooses to tell us about him is what? That he gave the right sacrifice at the right time. Amen? And then verse 7. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and did what? He built an ark. How long did Noah live? Well, 500 years by the time of the flood, but then he lived, I think, another 300 years or so after that, if I remember right. But what's he known for in the Scripture? Building a boat, right? So the Bible itself gives us a definition of the man. He says that, God says that Noah is known for his faith in building an ark like I told him to. You think there was anything else significant that happened in Noah's life? If you lived for 500 years, you think there might be some other things that happened? (laughs) Yeah, a lot of things, right? He got married. He had kids, had grandkids, made some other mistakes. Yeah. 
But the Bible recognizes him as somebody who is defined by moving out in faith and building a boat. Verse 8, Abraham, by faith Abraham obeyed God when he was called out to the place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. So what is Abraham known for? He's defined by his faith, right? Believing God, moving out in faith, and uh, doing these things. In fact, in verse 17 and 18, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So we know Abraham is moving out in faith, but we also, there might be a, a dual a definition here for Abraham, because we remember him as that guy that took his son and was going to sacrifice him to God, right? The definition of a man, the definition of a woman. What's your definition? As you and I look at ourselves, what are we defined by? You young people, you've been around for a few years. What are you known for? When people talk about you, and they do, what do they talk about? Are you known for being the class clown? Are you known for being the class pastor? Are you known for being the class brainiac? Or the class wallflower, as I was? <laughs> Nobody knew I was there. You know, there's lots of things that we can be known for. I had a time in my life as a pastor that I had to make a decision what I wanted to be known for. When I became a pastor, um, I began to learn that I could have friends of other people. Now, that may seem kind of strange, except some of you know my story. I've not been always that social. But I, I began to realize that there's some guys here that I could get to become friends with. And they were trustworthy and all. And the more you become friends with people, the more you kind of let your guard down, right? The more you begin to kind of loosen up a little bit. And I had to make a decision where I, whether I wanted to be known as a godly person or as one that's kind of, you know, flippant. You know, and looking for mischievous things. Some of you know that I can be kind of mis mischievous. Some of you are surprised by that. <laughs> My wife knows. <laughs> My grandkids know. But, uh, you know, I had a decision to make. And the Bible indicates here that each of these people were known specifically. God is the one that's recording them here, and they're known for certain characteristics. I want to take us to Matthew 26 now, our scripture. And Faith, I want to thank you for reading that today. You did a really good job. Matthew 26, amen? Amen. 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 Matthew 26, and we're going to look at verse 36. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. So you know the story. This is Passion Week. It is the coming to the close of the week. And Jesus goes on Thursday night, I believe it was, to the Garden of Gethsemane on Mount Olive. He's there for a very specific purpose. In fact, he's there fulfilling prophecy. Verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Now, what are we talking about today? The defining of mankind. Specifically. Specifically. Is there an event in history that we can say definitively states what mankind is like? 
distills all the essential elements of our entire history, our some 6,000 years of history, and distills it into a few verses, or perhaps a few people. Now that's an interesting thought. Is it possible that there's one person that could represent the entire human race? Is it possible that there's somebody in your family that could represent your family? In other words, if you saw that person, you say, oh, that's the Gomez family. Or, oh, that's the, that's the Green family. If you've seen that one, you've seen, you've seen all the Greens. Or, you know, something like that. Perhaps it's true, I don't know. But here we're looking at this, and it says in verse 37, And he took with him Peter and the sons, two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Verse 38. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible... Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So, Jesus here comes to the garden, and he begins that prayer that so much is at stake as he prays. Here's the principle we're working on today. In Romans 15, verse 4, the Bible says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So, what was written beforehand? What's it talking about? It's talking about the Old Testament specifically there, right. Talking about the stories of the Old Testament. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Paul says, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So Paul said that 2,000 years ago. Do you think that's still true today? Do you think that there are things written in the New Testament that we can learn from? that there is a history lesson in the things that take place in the New Testament as well as the Old that we can learn from. In fact, I think that we can look at them almost as a prophecy. What did I just say? Almost as a prophecy of what would happen just before Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. We're talking about the defining of humanity. And we're looking at how God defines humanity at the first coming and at the second coming. So verse 40. Then he, Jesus, came to the disciples and found them what? Sleeping. And said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now, Jesus doesn't say this in a derogatory way. I want this to be clear. Jesus is full of compassion and concern for his disciples. He knows the seriousness of the moment in history. Unlike us. How many of you remember 9-11? Remember watching it on TV, first turning the TV on, or whatever it was, the internet. Was the internet alive in 2001? I guess it was. Yeah, it was. Um, But how how many of you realized what was happening when you first saw those images? No, we had no clue. We did not know that really the destiny and the history of the United States was in the process of being changed radically. Because life today in America is not like it was in, in August of 2001. We have lost a lot of freedoms. We're not just talking about the memory of almost 3,000 people losing their lives. 
We're talking about being set on a path that radically changed the United States and actually moved it into closer uh, speaking like a dragon than it's ever been before. And we didn't know. We had no clue that that was taking place. In the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus comes back to the disciples and he finds them sleeping, he knows far better than anybody in the planet knows that things are never going to be the same after this night. That prophecy is being fulfilled and history is being made. A change is taking place. You know, what we see here, friends, is a symbol. A symbol of the state of the church at the second coming. When Jesus comes and finds his disciples what? Sleeping. Why do I say that? The parable of the ten virgins. That's right. That's what God prophesied would be the church in the last days. That we would be asleep. And here on the, on the eve of Jesus' death, as it were, at the first coming of Jesus, what is the church doing? It's sleeping. At the second coming, what does the Bible say the church will be doing? It will be sleeping. So there is no question that we see um, a parallel here. Verse 41. Watch and pray, he says to them again, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, is the, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. So Jesus goes again and he begins to pray. And the Bible Echo, which is an Australian magazine back in uh, 1892, the author says this, The awful moment had come that was to decide the what? So, is this a pretty significant event? You bet it is. Did the disciples know? Did the church know? Had no clue. We're defining humanity here. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. The Son of God might even now refuse to drink the bitter cup. He might wipe the bloody sweat from his brows and leave men to perish in their iniquity. Will the Son of the infinite God Drink the cup of humiliation and agony? Will the innocent suffer the curse of sin to save the guilty? But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's Redeemer. He will save man at any cost to himself. So you see, friends, according to this author, in fact, the fate of humanity hung in the balance church was asleep. So what's the definition of, the, of humanity at this point? We're asleep. Or they were asleep, right? They were asleep when they should have been awake. I mean, if your destiny is at stake, should you be asleep? No, that's the last thing you ought to be, right? You shouldn't be in bed if your destiny is at stake. You should be awake and seeking to combat whatever it is that is bringing about this confrontation. But the reality is, is that God reveals to us at the time of the first coming that the church was totally unaware of what was happening. It was asleep at the defining moment of history. And friends, that is a prophecy of humanity at the second coming as well. That you and I are asleep. Because is the fate of humanity hanging in the balance? It is. There are people around us that will go to a Christless grave because the church is asleep. I, I've been confronted with this a number of times as I pray and I, I work. And, and you know, some people think, well, you're a pastor, you're doing God's work. But I have my own burden sometimes that I'm not doing enough. 
that I want to do more because there are people that, that will not know the joys that I know unless I say something. But I'm asleep. I spend too much time on the computer. I spend too much time maybe driving around in my car. Maybe I spend too much time reading. Maybe I spend too much time with my family. Ooh, that's a sacred cow. Can you spend too much time with your family? Yes, you can. Now, should you put your family in the place where it needs to be that you need to make sure that your family knows Jesus Christ? Yes. But how, how do we know how we should relate to our family? You look at Jesus. How did Jesus relate to his family? Did he love his mother and his brothers and sisters? Yes. Did he provide for them? Yes. But when they wanted him to do something that was not God's will, did he do it? No. He put God first and his family second. You see, friends, there's, there's a lot of things that we can be asleep about and not realize. And we can be like Peter here, who is a symbol of that, last, that first day church as well as the last day church. Verse 43, 42. He went away again a second time. Did we read that? I think we did. Verse 40, well, we'll read it again then. Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them, what? Asleep again. For their eyes were heavy. So twice now, Jesus has come back to his church in the form of his disciples, and they're still asleep. Did they realize something was going on? Well, they should have because they noticed that Jesus was a lot quieter than he usually was. That is, exceedingly sorrowful unto death. He told them that. And they'd never seen their, their, their Savior that way before. Notice what it says here in Desire of Ages, page uh, 686. As Christ felt his unity with the Father broken up, he feared that in his human nature he would, not, he would be unable to endure the coming conflict with the powers of darkness. In the wilderness of temptation, the destiny of the human race had been at stake. Notice that. That was when he first started his ministry. Christ was then a conqueror. Now the tempter had come for the last fearful struggle. For this he had been preparing during the three years of Christ's ministry. Everything was at stake with the devil. How much was at stake? Did the devil understand the moment? He knew it was a defining moment of his history as well, let alone the human race. And so the devil understood, and so he throws everything he can at Christ. Continuing in Desire of Ages, if he failed here, his hope of mastery was lost. The kingdoms of the world would finally become Christ. He himself would be overthrown and cast out. But if Christ could be overcome, the earth would become Satan's kingdom and the human race would be forever in his power. Beloved, I believe with all my heart this is the defining moment of human history. This is the moment when it could have gone one way or the other. This is the time when, when the church should be awake and should be having watching into, pr into prayer, and she should be holding up the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. But what was the state of the church? The state of the church, the state of humanity, was that she was snoring. She was fast asleep, even though she should have understood what was happening. The devil knew what was happening. He knew that if he could overcome Christ then he had us all. Friends, that makes me shudder and tremble inside when I think about how close we were to becoming the subjects of Satan's kingdom. You see, what some people don't understand is that Christ could have failed. 
Pastor, he was God. He couldn't fail because God is perfect. You forget that he was made a human being. He came in the likeness of man and yet without sin. And he had a choice to make like we talked about in a, one of the last sermons. Jesus had a choice to make and his soul trembled. You read what Spirit of Prophecy says about this in Desire of Ages. This is an incredible experience here. Now, he goes on the third time. Verse 44, so he left them, went away again, and prayed the same, third time the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. What hour is at hand? Beloved, as we distill the essence of humanity down to its defining moment in some 6,000 years of, of history, we have at the first coming a picture of the church asleep in their darkest hour. Asleep. A picture of you and I at the second coming according to the Bible. We have Jesus coming to them and asking the question, what? Are you asleep? Friends, there is a dual defining here. Because it is good news that it is just not Peter that represents the church here. But it is a reality that Peter represents you and I. Not only at the first coming, but the second coming. Because we're asleep. We don't seem to understand how important our life is at this moment of time. That people's lives depend upon us. Literally. But the good news is, is Peter is not the only definition of the human race. Because we also have the picture of Jesus, amen? And Jesus is called the second Adam. Jesus is the one who came in the likeness of sinful flesh and died for you and I, that you and I might have life. And friends, you and I have a decision to make which definition of humanity we want to represent. We can choose to be like Peter and accept Peter's definition, or we can choose Jesus' definition. Because in the hour of the power of darkness, what was Jesus doing? Was he asleep? He was not asleep. He was wide awake. He understood what was going on. He was wrestling with the devil all that evening. He was pleading with God for victory over the devil's temptations. Not only for you and I, because he was praying for you and I. Friends, God is infinite. God is, is thinking of each of us all the time at the same time. And I believe in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was praying for me. He was praying for you. He was praying for each one of us here. He knew that if He did not overcome, that you were lost. That I was lost. He wasn't about to go asleep. He wasn't about to let His eyelids droop. He wasn't about to let Satan steal one over Him. Because He knew that because of His love for you, He wasn't going to go to sleep. Friends, when you love somebody that much and they're in dire straits and they have need of you, you're not going to go to sleep. You're going to push that away and you're going to do everything you can to make sure that person is saved. You're going to have superhuman strength. You know the stories of people that found themselves in difficult situations and... and a husband or wife or a child was in danger and all of a sudden they just got, seemed like incredible energy and they were able to stand in the gap. It wasn't a time to say, well, should I or shouldn't I? It was a time for action. And Jesus took action in the Garden of Gethsemane. Friends, here is the real defining of humanity. 
Here is the definition of humanity for the entire existence of the human race. It's found right there in the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus claws the earth, pleading with his Father that if it's not possible that this cup passes, that you would give him the power and the grace to overcome. And what does the Bible say? Jesus overcame. He vanquished the devil. And forever now, the human race is defined not by sleeping saints, but by a conquering Savior. Aren't you glad the story ends differently than it started out? Praise God that we have somebody that came to our, our rescue, to our defense, who knew that we, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, who understood that we want to do things, but sometimes because of sin, we fail miserably. So here's the question that I'm going to leave you with this morning. What moment in your history defines you? Was the moment when you got drunk and had a good time? Was it the moment you got married that stands out the most? Or was it the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And from that moment on, you became defined by the Savior you accepted. How many would like to make that statement this morning? Father in heaven, you see our hands today. Lord, you know that if we're left to ourselves, the definition of our lives would be totally empty. You knew that. And so you sent your son to come and live at that one moment in earth's history, especially what it would be the definition of the human race stamped, engraved forever upon their psyche. It was his finest hour. And if we will accept it, it can be our finest hour as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.